As part of my series of interviews, face-to-face -face interviews with those who occupy the press box at football grounds up and down the country, I travel to South Yorkshire to meet one of the finest sports reporters in the UK, Alan Biggs. And now he's written a book called Confessions of a Football Reporter, which you can buy via the blog www.wordofsport.blogspot.com It's a great read, so much so that I read it from cover to cover in one go. Those watching Final Score on BBC or listening to Radio 5 Live will be used to his coverage of games. Like all the more experienced journalists, he paints a picture for you if you cannot get to the game yourself. And with clarity, conciseness and humour. What skills today are required to be a good football reporter? Any different from way back when? Or? Um, I think uh, the simple reportage of a game is no longer uh, where it's at. Although, in broadcasting terms, and I come from a background of live reports on, on radio and now on final score on television, that has become uh, more fact-based and punchy fact-based. Fact uh, I came into Five Live, or Radio 2 as it was, then Sport On 2, and my God, I, I couldn't eat before some Saturdays when I first got on that. I couldn't believe I was on this institutional program. Certainly when you came to Sports Report, it, it, it could be, it had to be around the game, but you needed to dress it up. It had to be a well-crafted colour piece and having listened in my youth to the likes of Peter Jones and Brian Butler and the best. Stuart Hall, you know, <laughs> Stuart Hall's a, a different kettle of fish in, entirely, you know, Stuart's a great character. I tried to hit what I thought was the level I should be pitching it at. That uh, would appear to have got out of the window in, in most sports broadcasting now. You don't have those crafted, wonderful word pictures anymore, particularly in football. You still can in cricket, but there aren't quite the exponents of it that, that, that there were. You talk a lot in the book about um, how it used to be you know, back when as a, as a reporter, but is the reporting any better now that they're all sober? in the press box? Not necessarily, no. no. But I, I think in terms of paying attention uh, to what goes on, yeah, the, the reporting is better. And I think it's also stimulated by the presence of cameras at every game. Um, the availability of replays at every Premiership game in press boxes can make you a little bit lazy. You'll see it again, but also you know that particularly if a game's going out live on TV and you're there covering it for a newspaper or a radio station, you know that there are people in your office or your studio who are getting a much closer view of it and a better view of it than you. Yeah. Well, uh, maybe it's my nature. I, I, I think that the, the rows that are, the, that are in the book, I've come to realise are to coin a cliche, part and parcel of the, mm. of the job. I also think that one of the most refreshing aspects of reporters' relationships with managers is that these rows are done and dusted and that people don't bear grudges. Maybe, you know, in, in a few instances that can, that can be the case, but generally I've found that managers have had a go, I've thought about it, are they right or are they wrong, and we've moved on. Um, I think that's that's refreshing, and no, I mean there are there are managers that I had a spectacularly bad relationship with um, that maybe I haven't put in the book. There was a time, and I, I know we, we we were talking before the interview about Peter Eustace's short ten, tenure at Sheffield Wednesday. A lot went wrong for him in a very very short space of time. Uh, he fell out with many of his players. He certainly fell out with journalists, including myself, and that wasn't patched up within his tenure. But that was just a four-month period. Uh, is it fair to judge a Sheffield Wednesday legend like Peter Eustace on four months where he had a particularly hard job following Howard Wilkinson? I don't think it is fair. They, there's more of an arm's-length relationship now. I'm lucky in that in Sheffield I've still got a relationship with the two managers there and have done for years where I can ring them up. 
and talk directly to them. But this increasingly is a rarity in the game. Certainly it will be in the Premiership. I doubt there are any journalists there who can just pick up a phone and ring a Premiership manager. Well, very few, anyway. But that used to be the norm. And because it used to be the norm, the conversations weren't all on the record. People became trusted, they were off the record, and there was conversation about, you know, for instance, I'm going to a certain game tonight, uh, X and Y are playing, and the manager might say, oh, will you see so-and-so, a player? If you do, can I have a word? Because I'd, I'd really fancy signing him. Just see if you can sell, sell it to me for me. And that happened on numerous occasions in my career. Doesn't happen now. Even with the, the guys that I deal with on a regular basis, we speak about once a week on the phone. Some of it's off the record, yeah. Um, but I would say that that part of journalism is slipping by. Now there's a man that wouldn't bear a grudge. You know, I, I, I saw him get aggrieved, get ratty at times, but there were never grudges. He, he would fall out with people, but he wouldn't harbour it. Um, and the irony with him uh, is that Wednesday fans to this day, some still call him Judas, but actually I've seen in, in a different avenue, I've seen the generosity of spirit of Ron Atkinson that would would make him the last person as a friend that you would call a Judas. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I think he was just, it was a human situation. He was totally torn. Yes. You know, uh, he was almost railroaded into, into staying by emotion. So we had a situation time. where Wednesday won the League Cup yeah. against Man United at Wembley. He was asked by yourself, by John Helm, by numerous journalists, are you staying or are you going to Villa? Are you going to Villa? He said, no, I'm staying with Wednesday. I can't leave this club. Um, and then he went to Villa. Mm. A week <laughs> later. To dug it yeah. some old people. So he did, and I think he, he was in turmoil, genuine turmoil. And he's since admitted it was a mistake, and it was, wasn't it? Well, it was, apart from the drive, of course. The thing he hated was, yeah. yes, it was a mistake, yeah. People said he drove up from Birmingham. It was well south of Birmingham, wasn't it? Yeah. I did. Uh, I can remember it vividly. Uh, I was on promenade at Weymouth on holiday with my parents in 1966, just a few weeks after a momentous event in uh, world and English football. And you wouldn't expect to see one of your heroes and a member of that England World Cup winning team squatting on the sand with his family eating a picnic. <laughs> Two weeks now, after the World Cup. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Could, it, could that have happened at any time since? And probably it didn't happen in 66 to any other, or involving any other England World Cup winning player other than plain Big Jack. Jack, Big Jack. And, and years there later, was. when he's managing at Wednesday, Sheffield Wednesday, you, you come to have daily dealings with him? I did, I did. Uh, you know, uh, pinch yourself. Uh, I, I, autograph, I got his autograph on, on the beach there at, uh, at Weymouth and the next time I came face to face with him he'd just been appointed Wednesday manager. Um, it's told in the book, yes, yeah. uh, a snooker match, that's, that's what it was about, it was silly really and, and looking back uh, I broke a cardinal rule there of uh, a journalist relationship with people in a football club that he covers certain things remain private but I felt this was harmless it was just purely one Friday waiting for him uh, to do the standard pre-match interview for Radio Hallam he and Terry Curran were playing snooker they argued over a point of rules Jack saw me with the tape machine came over stomping over to get his version uh, of the ruling on the tape. Terry did likewise and Jack told me when you get back to the studio find out and there's a fiver on it and we I duly did the pre-match interview and I couldn't resist something which today you know, I, I, or at any time since I wouldn't have done. I just thought this is harmless fun, we'll put it on air and I'll get Mike Watterson who's the promoter of the World Snooker in Sheffield to come on live 
and adjudicate. He adjudicated against Jack, which is where I feel that Jack was particularly peeved. Uh, but it was a private thing. I shouldn't have done it. Uh, I heard that he was very annoyed, and I rang him up to face the, uh, the yeah. music. It wasn't very musical. No. <laughs> Lasted about 30 seconds. Yes. You know, it can't be repeated. He had a way with words. To he did. <clears throat> and then said, do you want to do an interview? Did they not realise what they had in Neil Warnock? No, I don't think they did. Uh, and, but he also understood this. He, he never uh, acted aggrieved or hurt about this. He always used to say to me, it's just a minority, Alan. He said, it's, the, 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 most of them were with me, you know. Most of them, and he never, and I thought he was quite shrewd not to, because there were times when he'd have been quite justified having a pop back based on what he achieved there. But he, he didn't, and I, I think he thought it through, and I think he, he thought that it would be interpreted as having a go at all the fans, it would rebound on him, it wouldn't do him any favours. So he lived with that, but he always felt that an outsider as a manager wouldn't have had that based on his record there, would have commanded more respect. It was almost like the boy next door that you can have a go at. He's one of ours, we'll give him a good kicking. You know, I've spoken to him recently for the book and uh, he cut very kindly did the foreword for yeah. me. I think he's very happy with his lot. He, uh, he lives some of the time abroad in Spain. and does he? Yes, yeah. he does, yeah, yeah. yeah. And comes over to England just for uh, match duty. Uh, seems very contented, quiet family man. You know, what, what you see is what you get there. But certainly his record at Birmingham was pretty decent, wasn't it? He just fell short. He's, he seemed to fall short of the, the big prizes, the trophies at both Hillsborough and Birmingham. Uh, but a thoroughly decent man, and what a joke when you look back. They finished 13th. <laughs> this is Sheffield Wednesday. Sheffield Wednesday. 13th in the Premiership. Yeah, and he was sacked. But I, I read in a book recently, a history of Wednesday, that uh, he was uh, surprisingly sacked uh, following that. He was effectively sacked two or three months in advance of that and knew full well. It was an open secret. I like him as a man. Uh, I, as, as, as a manager, uh, he didn't achieve possibly what he could have achieved uh, at Sheffield Wednesday. I don't think his record was bad. I think he came in at a time when he had to break up a, a very ageing squad. Trevor Francis, before David Pleat, knew that that was a task he had to face. You're talking about the Sheridans, the Waddles, the heroes. You know, they were getting older. Um, and I think that was a particularly time, a difficult time to manage Sheffield Wednesday. If anything, I felt that David was too complicated a thinker. Nothing was ever black or white with him, it was always shades of grey and he would agonise over it and think about it almost too much and therefore could be indecisive. He didn't do the sound bite, Howard. Uh, he, he couldn't. And I first came across this when he was uh, working for Boston United. Um, and my boss at Radio Hallam at the time, I used to go to games, Stuart Linnell, who was in the studio, uh, enlisted Howard to be a, an expert pundit alongside his reporter. So I, I went to games with Howard in that time. And we had to be brief and succinct. And I would give a, an update on what was going on, bring Howard in for an expert an analysis, which he was told would have to be 20 or 30 seconds maximum. And he was incapable of encapsulating the game in that time because his thought processes were so complicated, complex, but also because he's such an intelligent man as well. And as a manager, he found the same thing, that what was a science to him couldn't be distilled in that. 10 second soundbite and he didn't really enjoy the media part of the job and I have to say that working with him was very difficult at times but that doesn't mean to say that you don't respect somebody and you have to respect what Howard did uh, and has done in the game okay. uh, very good manager there's a connection between South Yorkshire and the national game um, explain to me how a man who took a premiership club into almighty debt 
uh, got to be possibly the most powerful man in English football. I speak of Sir David Richards. Um, the man, let us not forget, responsible for giving Fabio Capello a new and very lucrative contract as England manager prior to England playing in the World Cup. How on earth does somebody like that get to be in a position like that? <laughs> explain to me, because I don't know. I can't explain it. I can't. I can't explain it. Uh, I mean, he ruined absolutely. Sheffield Wednesday, no? Not that he was. I, I'm going to go for a, a, a balanced so take on, on that. Fence, no, 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 no. I'm going to. I, I think you, you've got to be balanced. Uh, okay, he came on the board, um, and I thought he made an impact. Uh, he was open and approachable as well at that time. The club became more transparent, for once of a better word. Bert McGee, his predecessor, was a, an old-fashioned, trusty type chairman, and a good man. Dave Richards recognised, or the club I think recognised, Bert McGee recognised, we've got to move on here. And the purse strings were loosened, weren't they? Yes. Ron Atkinson had been appointed by Bert McGee, but Dave Richards quickly took over. And whether Dave was in awe of Atkinson or not, and possibly was, he let him have his way with the checkbook. Where I would particularly take issue with Dave Richards is the manner in which he treated his managers and in particular the way he dispensed with them the at times, particularly Trevor. Yeah. Uh, and also Ron Atkinson second time around, you know, I think it was another cup final day announcement. Dave Allen, former chairman of Sheffield Wednesday and now chairman of Chesterville, comes out smelling of roses in your book. He's, you're quite pro Dave Allen even though some Wednesday fans were not, um, but he did insult fans of his own club at the time at Sheffield Wednesday. Is that a good move for a chairman? No, I say so in the book. You know, there are there are certain things that you a chairman can't say, um, and at the time he said them and following them with a close working relationship, I distanced myself from it. Is the best way to put it. We all get compromised in football by relationships and any journalist who says that he's not compromised by relationships is lying. Unfortunately this is the world we live in and at the time I squirmed uh, but I, I like to think I'm a loyal person uh, and he and I struck up a very good relationship which we still have. Uh, so I w it wasn't until writing the book that I was able to be perhaps a bit more balanced about that. I fully understand where he was coming from. He did take a lot of unwarranted, in my opinion, abuse. Considering that the bloke put a substantial amount of money in and no Wednesday director has done that before, he didn't deserve it. The way he reacted to it was wrong. But what he didn't make clear was that his targets were a minority. Um, and the majority thought that he was talking about them, which he wasn't. He's not a diplomat, Dave Allen, never has been, never will be. Part of the strength of the man, in a way, in those difficult times, that he would call the spade a proverbial shovel. He was no-nonsense, he was dictatorial and made no apologies for that. In your book there's some great incidents, some sort of memorable incidents in, in domestic football. Um, a man managing Swindon Town now, who was responsible for what you call in the book, and I quote, the most startling incident on a football pitch, close quote. I speak, of course, of Paolo Di Canio. You were there? I was there. Could you believe what you were seeing? No. No, and it was bang in front of me as well. Uh, right down on that near touchline on the south stand. It was great to be there. <laughs> great to be live on Radio 5 within a couple of milliseconds of the referee tumbling to the ground. Paul Alcock, huh? Paul Alcock, yeah. Did you know, he I, fall or was he pushed? There was a significant shove in his chest, but it shouldn't have, you know, it was more than, let's put it like this, it was more than laying hands on a referee, which is a, a sending off offence in itself. It was a shove in the, in, in the chest. Um, and we couldn't believe what we were seeing. Uh, but there was, it was highly challenging to go live with it because there'd been such a, a build-up, such a sequence of events leading to it, which has 
you know, um, and other journalists know, but as you know, uh, fans don't know, you, you have to have a tape in your head, don't you? You have to have a, a rewind facility in your head to be able to replay that in your head and talk at the same time fluently about what, you, what, what, what you're actually seeing. And a couple of players, I think Winterburn, Rudy, were, were involved. From memory, I'd have to, I'd have to read. I didn't know. I, didn't, after I, I possibly didn't know or have forgotten until I read your book. Mm. Martin Keown was sent off as well as Pat Now, Ducanio. I didn't spot it at the time. I, didn't, I, don't, I, I still don't think I knew until yesterday when I read your book. Really? Well, I don't think so. I think if I'd, rem I think I didn't see it. I didn't see it. I don't well, I had to it. be, I had to be told, and, and the, these are mortifying moments for reporters. I had to be well prompted by, I think it was maybe John Inverdale in the studio after I'd wrapped up the whole sensation of Di Canio pushing the referee over and him disappearing down the tunnel. I was asked live, and is. Has Martin Keown been sent off as, as well? Is, is he on the field? And I had to look, and he wasn't on the field, and I came to the conclusion that he had been sent off. You think, how derelict in my duty was I there? But at half-time, all the broadcasters got together, and not one of us had noticed it. So much was going off. Because either Scarborough or Carlisle could be relegated from the football league from the football Kaput. league and my colleague and friend Peter Slater was five lives man at Carlisle and I was covering the other game at Scarborough I forget the exact permutation of results but well in fact I do remember as of 90 minutes and my full-time match report on Scarborough they drawn one apiece they were still in the football league because Carlisle were also drawing I think by the same score, but Carlisle was still still playing. Now, at that moment, particularly at small ground, you're encircled by supporters, all of whom wanted to know what was going on at Carlisle, had it finished. And I, I was telling him, hang on, hang on, into injury time, one apiece, hold on. Then, only I could hear, they couldn't, or one or two could with transistor radios. This unbelievable uh, scenario that you couldn't <laughs> make up ever. Roy of the Rovers stuff. Yeah. For that generation. Yeah, that the Carlisle goalkeeper had gone up for a corner and had scored a goal that kept them in the football league. Nigel Pearson was manager. And I heard this in total incredulity and wondered how I could possibly break this news to these anxious people around me. I didn't tell them the goalkeeper had scored, I just simply said, Carlisle have scored. Crestfallen. I, th I think we underestimate, although, we, although it's only a game, and we have to remind ourselves it's only a game, when a football club leaves the Football League, it equates to a death in the family. Yes. You know, the emotions are that raw on that day, and you have to respect that. But I couldn't engage with these supporters because I had probably the most difficult final score piece to do of my career within a couple of minutes of that because we were top on sports report peter and i were back to back we were the main story on sports report and normally you've got it scripted i'd only got the first three or four sentences scripted that day Scarborough because you, and they've never come back from and they've never come back and that's how damaging a blow it was for them and they were within seconds and it's history page 167 of your book, you say, quotes, it's just a pity that the consequences of obscene player wages have yet to fully hit the clubs who created this un unsustainable spiral. Um, sounds like, does that mean you want the Man Uniteds and Liverpools and Man Cities of this world to I think it'd suffer? Be, I know, not anyone in particular, but I think it would be good for the game if they did. What? go bust or suffer or yeah or come close to really that sounds a bit yeah well to start can we not say can, can we no 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 can we not send out what would be more effective in slowing down okay football says it's sustainable it's sustainable to pay a player five or six million pounds a year 
okay, so therefore it's legal, and therefore somebody like myself or anybody else who disagrees can't take objection to it. That, 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 that's the argument. It's sustainable. Let me ask you, is it morally sustainable? No, but there's no morals left in football. But there should be. Well, of course there should be. I'm a romantic. Yeah, you know, I'm gullible. I'm naive. You know, I'm back on the terraces. I like to believe what I'm seeing. Uh, How can I, you be I find... gullible or naive when you've been in a press box for as long as you have in this developing modern game? Well, I don't think I'm gullible or naive on this particular thing, but maybe I'm, I'm being idealist uh, about it. And I'd like to think there were more idealists out there. Well, there are of a certain age group. Our age group, there are. But, yeah. But, but if you're a What's Man City fan... It? Yeah, but if you're a Man City fan now, you're not putting Colin Bell and Franny Lee and Neil Young up on your bedroom wall. You think the end justifies the means. Throw money at it. doesn't matter whether we're billions in debt. I suppose if Lots I was a Manchester things. City fan, I would think the same way. But I'm, I'm looking from a moral standpoint, and I, I just think that the wages in a society where... And I won't bring politics into it, and this does not give a clue to my political leaning. I, I, I don't think it matters which political party you support. To pay anybody millions a year for kicking a ball is morally unjustified. It's absolutely obscene. It is sickening. Uh, no matter whether clubs can afford it or not, that in a recession-hit society particularly, that's why I say that with no vindictiveness against any particular big club, if one of those came really close to going bust and, and sent a warning out and maybe slowed it down and brought it in check, it would be a good thing. If football, from the top, could say, OK, no player or participant in football can be paid more than £1 million a year. Nobody. Because uh, I could just about go to that. You know, that if somebody reaches the top as a player, yeah, of course they deserve to earn more than the man in the street. You know, of course they deserve to earn hundreds of thousands of pounds a year. But who needs more than that? Um, and why? And, and the distance that we've we've put between players and, and, and fans, you know, it's just sickening. Uh, but we should try to qualify this, Vernon, as well. That the public thinks, oh, footballers. It's not. It's it's a very fractional percentage Tevis, of footballers. Thanks. Yeah. It's too many. There's just too many phone-ins. Uh, the fans used to have too little say. They've got too much now. You know, and the media, perhaps, it's cheap, cheap broadcasting, isn't it? Uh, yes, and there's a perception yes. that it's very popular broadcasting. It wins audiences. I don't know whether that's true or not. I suppose it must do. Otherwise, things like 606 would be discontinued. And I have to plead guilty to this, that when I'm doing final score with the time pressures on reports, I all too seldom make reference to what a good game the referee's having. The reason I perhaps don't make reference to it is it's not considered newsworthy and it's using up 10 seconds of time. And if we're sat here in 50 years' time then, finally, do you think there'll be such a thing as a football report? Not in the mode of today. Um, I, I can't imagine what that... What doesn't happen now is people don't speak to each other. Who? Who doesn't speak to each other? Oh, you mean it's... People generally. All oh, right. You know that... Well, we've done this. We've done this. We've frozen our nuts off over a yeah. pint, but we've spoken to each other. But that communication, you get an email, you get a text. Yes. And so it's become electronic. We do a lot... You know, we arrange our lives around... Facebook and All that Twitter and... But there might be, I don't know, it might be in the press box, it might just be full of lots of machines sending match reports rather than humans. Could well be. <laughs> Could well be. And in which we case, meet... in which case, aren't we lucky to have lived when we have? Indeed. And reported when you have. You, yes. You've had the best years. Yes. I'd like to think there's some more good years no, left. but you know what I mean. You've had... Yeah. You've had some, yeah, some mighty fine years reporting. I have indeed. And I'm really grateful. And I've really enjoyed... Hey, the, the best chat, you know, is when we this, this camera gets turned off yes. and we sit with a pint, get inside, and get warm, get in that pub, 
and then we can really talk. And a pint we surely had. Thanks, Alan, for your time. Now your chance to win a signed copy of his book, Confessions of a Football Reporter. OK, a quiz question for you to deal with football in Yorkshire. Eric Cantona played his first football game for a team in Yorkshire. Which team was it? Which colours, which shirt, which team in Yorkshire did Eric Cantona first wear in England playing a game of football?